Well, hey guys, welcome back to Verified Christian Podcast. I'm super excited to get to be here with you today. You guys know me, my name's Cody, and I'm here joined with my good friend, Jake Moivau. You can say something, Jake. After we're done rocking out. After we're done rocking out. And of course, <laughs> on the board, working the magic, Pastor Brett. Brett, thank you for being here too. Hola. So um, it's obviously been a really long time since we've done a podcast, and this is kind of like a, a little bit of a new entry for us as podcasters. We're looking to boot the podcast back up, but we're also looking to use it as a tool to meet you during the week right where you're at and bring some encouragement to whatever situation you're going through. We know that here in life, like we get together on Sunday mornings for people of faith, if you're listening to this podcast and um, maybe maybe you're not from a religious background. We're from a church. We're Christian people, and, um, and we get together on Sunday mornings, and we worship God. We draw near to God. We draw near to one another, but during the week, sometimes things get hard. Things happen. Life gets tough, and so we're hoping that this new season of podcast could just be a midweek pick me up for you. So we have all these different podcasts coming out over the next eight weeks, believe it or not, um, following up with each sermon and some kind of iconic or unique way that it connects to the message just to continue to encourage you and help you as you develop and grow in the Lord. So this one's actually real special to me and near dear to my heart because my good friend Jake is here. He's going to be giving uh, his Devo on Sunday. We're shooting this one before he speaks. Um, But we're doing a podcast on reconciliation today. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's special because uh, the last time me, Jake, and Brett all sat at the same table, and we decided, how long ago was it, Brett? 11 years ago? 11 years ago, we had a royal falling out. (laughs) I mean, it makes a boy band breakup look cute. Like, it was was bad. And, you know, some of us didn't really talk for years, you know? And, um, And little by little, God has brought us all back together. So if anyone has done it wrong as when it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to relationship and learned what grace really is and what it means to forgive one another, it's the three of us. And so we wanted to come here and just bring an honest conversation about reconciliation, how to get right with people. Jake, you got any thoughts opening up? Yeah, uh, got a lot of thoughts, but um, yeah, it's just cool to be here. And um, I think... uh, God's got some plans for us just being transparent and hopefully it's an encouragement to whoever hears it. Yeah. And also I think, um, you know, one of the the strongest convictions on my heart as a believer is that God loves every part of us and he wants us to bring every part of us to him as a loving father. And so, um, I just, I appreciate any opportunity to be open and transparent of everything and anything and especially the mistakes. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to just and this having is, a conversation. And this is kind of like conversation point two, because we had a conversation <laughs> that wasn't mic where Jake was like, dude, I did you wrong. And I was like to yeah. Brett and I was like, man, I did a lot of things wrong. And the only one who didn't actually apologize yet was Brett. Yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> we're, we're saying this is, this is why reconciliation is like a growing thing, you know? <laughs> What? No, no, never <laughs> mind. We're moving on. We're moving on from that point. Uh, I, I forgave you guys. <laughs> That's right. He did. I forgave he, did. he was actually probably the first to forgive, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, so this is this is just kind of a real talk for us. So I, I went ahead and brought some questions with me because you guys know how my mind likes to think. I like to ask questions. So uh, first off, I, I put down like, what does reconciliation even mean? And uh, for those of you who are from our church, you know, being a homeschooler, I love to look up words, look up word definitions. If you didn't know I was homeschooled and that bothers you, I'm sorry, (laughs) but I am. And uh, reconcile means restore friendly relations between, cause to coexist in harmony, make or show to be compatible. I love that. Restore friendly relations. When we think about reconciliation and it's kind of its simplest definition, we think to make things right. Now, reconciliation has a little more flavor to it than that. Its synonyms are balance, harmonize, square, attune. It also means to make, as in an account, make one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for transactions begun but not yet completed. Now, the reason I love that definition is because that's how the reconciliation of the gospel works, Mm -hmm. right? Where God, God is saving you and I, and that redemption is not yet fully complete. It is complete. The transactions happen, 
but there's a completion still coming. And we're going to talk about God and reconciliation today too. But for you and I, most of the time, it's that first definition of we're trying to restore what we have mutually broken. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, I agree. And I appreciate you doing the homeschool thing and getting the definition because I had no idea that in depth of a definition of reconciliation. <laughs> so there we go. That's that's my like my niche, my gang. I was hey. homeschooled. <laughs> it's a good game. It's a helpful <laughs> game. It's just me and my siblings, actually. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was our leader. Okay, you know what? We're gonna stop there. <laughs> It's not as cool being homeschooled. If they, you can, they had really fun dances. We by the way. <laughs> their their school, yeah, you know, yeah, just great. Really fun dances. We only have one sister, so <laughs> probably had the best cookies though. It was the best cookies. <laughs> and if you're not watching, uh, like our our video podcast, you really should because Jake it looks so much like me. He's large, covered mm-hmm. in tats, like. Football hat, football coach. Um, it, if that's not how you visualize me, well, you should watch the podcast thing because it's true. Basically twins. So it's basically twins. <laughs> I'm by yeah. no means small, Caucasian, and you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, I, it's so cool because when we talk about friendship, we talk about unity, we talk about reconciliation, the first thing I want you to understand is there's this principle in the Bible that in Christ Jesus, God has taken away the things that separate us from one another. That's our basis for friendship. And we have to start with that because as people of faith, as Christians, our whole understanding, foundation, and approach to reconciliation is based off of the way God has treated us and the, way, and the things that God has done for us. And so we studied this in our church recently, but because God has, in the salvation he's given, because he's removed the boundaries that were between us, it's why people like me, Jake, Brett, who in some ways couldn't be more different from one another mm-hmm. in so many ways— are, can be such close friends. And it's the very reason that when we have a falling out, the reason we can find our way back home to each other is because our reconciliation is based off of a God who had done nothing wrong, who went out of his way to make a way home for you and me. So we want you to understand like that's the backdrop for reconciliation that we're going to approach this from. Sure. Yeah, and I love that idea of um, you know the cross being one of the things Jesus refers to himself as is our mediator. Yeah. And I was thinking about like when you I don't know, maybe I'm uh, I'm a f- apologize to my family in advance if I'm spilling family business out there. But, you know, in our family, if you got tension or drama or beef with uh, with someone else, you usually find whoever the family member is that's halfway cool with both of you guys. And then you get them to like come meet, you know, for a meal or whatever. And that way you're not alone with the person you're viewing at the moment as your enemy. But you got, you know, somebody that'll just kind of bring you together. and uh, Or if someone gets killed, there's a witness. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now you're telling too many secrets. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, but or even in the professional world, they have HR to play mediator between, you know, uh, whoever's been offended and whoever's done the offense. So I think uh, it's a cool thing that Jesus does. And it also on a personal note, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Forgive me if I am. But, um, you know. As I look back and even in the present, whenever there's reconciliation needed between me and somebody else, I realize it's because some part of my heart has wandered from Jesus. Yeah. Like if if I'm walking in step with him, reconciliation is minimal, if not necessary at all. Yeah. But every time that I've done something like this, you know, situation that you were referring to 11 years ago uh, as a very, very arrogant and egocentric, bullheaded talented but stupid um high school pastor um i can honestly say humbly that i wasn't in the best place with jesus yeah so it makes all the sense in the world that when we're not close to jesus we're not gonna love like jesus yeah we're not gonna be humble like jesus so well and it's fair to say the only person more arrogant than you in the room at the time was probably brett (laughs) (laughs) just kidding (laughs) just kidding uh, it was me, okay. I owned it. It was me. I was, I was gonna say Cody was a mediator in that situation. He didn't do anything. He, I didn't know what to he do. Just, he just sat there and cried in the corner. The I did. Time. What was I supposed to do? You're both bigger than me. Oh, it man. was. It, yeah, it was not our finest moment. And you know, it wasn't the last time that groups of us would have arguments. Sure. On the side, and yet I think I've. I think 
it's been so fun because we've all reconnected as time has gone on and how much God has changed. Just like Jake, you said you've been to counseling. Mm-hmm. I've been to counseling since then. Brett should probably I'm, go to counseling. I counsel- married a counselor. You I mean, married a counselor. <laughs> Brett needed He wins. It. You know, and all of us had so much baggage and, and, and so many things we had to work through. And I love that you said it's when we're not walking with Jesus that things yep. get off. And I also think that's what makes reconciliation so hard is because you have to get right with Jesus to get right with others. Yep. And I was talking with a friend about this earlier today, and I was asking him, like, why do you feel like reconciliation can be so hard for people? And I have a couple of reasons we can talk about as we go. But one thing that I love that he said is it's hard to be honest, admit something as true to others or even to yourself. And he said that, and I thought, that really is so much at the core of why we struggle with reconciliation. It's hard to say I was wrong, that I've wounded people, that I've maybe done evil or done what wasn't right in God's sight. I got to be honest with God. I got to be honest with myself. And then I have to go be honest with that person. And that can be a tricky thing to do because it takes quite a bit of humility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I completely agree. And um, yeah, just ownership. We were talking about it before we went on. Um, I'm a huge Jocko guy. Yeah, and one of Jocko the, Willink, Navy SEAL. If you don't know who we're talking about, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, one of the books that changed my life uh, for the better, emotionally and mentally, was uh, Extreme Ownership. It's a great book. And uh, I have, I admit, Jocko, if you listen to this, thank you. But uh, I had to purchase because I'm such a fan of Jocko's. I purchased the signed copy. So <laughs> paid the extra thirty bucks, got the signed copy. Anywho, um just the concepts and that the principles in that book of taking ownership for what you've done or what you said and, and yeah. um and and jumping off track a little here, I think at some point God used that book to reveal to me that as a minority, low income inner city youth I've been raised in an environment that preaches a lot of victim mentality and victimization perspective. Yeah. As if somebody owes you something because some invisible white guy in the sky is named the man and he just doesn't want you to succeed in life. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just I realized like the gospel just shone through all that. Like that's a lie from the pit of hell. Like, yeah, God loves us. Jesus died for all of us. Jesus really ain't concerned about our skin color, or body type, nothing like that. Yeah. Socioeconomic class. But that book helped me see the toxic mentality that I had gone most of my life having. Yeah. And I think when you feel like a victim, you're automatically defensive. You're automatically egocentric. You're automatically. Yeah. It's like a barrier to love like Jesus loved. Well, when you're when you put yourself in the victim spot, you can't accept ownership yeah. for what you've did wrong because the. the definition of being the victim spot is is you're in this place because of the way they've treated you or you behave this way because of what they first did to you right in order to get out of that in some ways it seems like you have to own that like i've also been on the aggressor side of this issue right i'm not just the victim i'm also the aggressor yeah and that's a hard place for us to get sometimes yep for sure and I don't know what you guys think, Brett. We want you to jump in. Yep. You know, you're just as guilty of that problem originally as as we are. <laughs> but uh, when I thought about it, the number one issue is ego. To, in my mind, yep. there's so much. There's pride is such a roadblock. There's so much rooted in that that it, it it's one of the big hindrances to reconciliation. At least that I've experienced in my life. It's hard for me to admit I'm wrong. It's hard for me to humble my. It's hard for me to humble myself. Mm-hmm. And it is hard for me to, to ex- I guess, accept, like you said, and own it. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I have to lower myself in their eyes. But even more painfully, I have to lower myself in my own eyes. And I have to say to myself that I'm not as good as I thought I am. Or I'm not as perfect or whatever you fill in the blank. And really just look them in the eyes and say, I am just as broken as you. And I've done something wrong. Well, I think that's <clears throat> because it's contrary um, to the world's view, right? Yeah. Like the, yeah. the world would say that humility is weakness. Right. I mean, if you're yeah. humble and you prefer other people over yourself, you're never going to get anywhere in the world. Yep. And, um, and so I think we have that mentality of, of, well, I need to stand up for myself. I, I, I need to, um, uh, be strong and, and that ego, that pride of, of like, this is who I am, deal with it kind of a thing. I think that's why, it is so difficult for us to admit our wrongs, yep. you know, to yeah. admit that we, yep. yeah, that, that, you know, 
we, yeah. we can't hear people. I mean, just like we were talking earlier, it wasn't until years later that um, some of the things that we said in that meeting that was said to me were correct. You know what I mean? But in the moment, I was like, that's not correct. You know, yeah. because I was just, I was so full of pride and thinking like, well, I've done this way longer than you guys. I've been in ministry and I know what I'm doing, you know, kind of a thing. But, right. but really like there was so much truth to it that I didn't really hear it until mm. later on down the road where God was speak, speaking to my heart. I would, I would say if I had to be like define all three of us, I would say we were amazing at telling the truth. We were terrible at receiving it. Maybe, yeah. maybe how we told the truth wasn't it, great. Yeah, <laughs> we told the truth. It wasn't truth and love. It was like truth with blood, you know? And then it was, we weren't great at receiving it from one another either. I go, I go back, you know, to many conversations. I know that you and I would have later, Jake, and I, I, I look back and I'm like, there's probably pieces of truth in the things we were saying to each other. There wasn't a lot of love. And there was hardly any reception on either end. Like, I think you went mm-hmm. your, your way thinking, you know, like, nope, I'm in the right. And I went my way thinking, like, nope, I was right. And all we were doing was digging deeper trenches to try yeah. and climb out of. Yeah. Yep. And, and, you know, outside of just us three, you said something, Code, um, before we started that uh, you noticed in hindsight – that you were detaching and disengaging from a lot of people. That was kind of your, one of your ways you dealt with um, ego or whatever. Right. Like you weren't the only one that was doing that. Like, I think I, I realized when you said that, I was like, man, that's exactly what I did too is yeah. if people rub me wrong or, or they're not, you know, uh, I don't know if they just rub me wrong. If I don't like them, I just kind of cut them out and move on and, and yeah. get new people in the circles and, um, but I think that's that's one of the many complexities of 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 our ego. Yeah, is that I think our sin nature wants pleasure, right? And we think, oh, we get more pleasure. I'll say me, I get more pleasure from moving on from this than dealing with whatever God's trying to use this relationship for in me. Yeah, I would rather have my own comfort and self satisfaction of just not having this like sandpaper, right? Of yeah. Whoever it is. And, and I think w- all of us can relate to this, like no better example of like how God uses a person in our life to reform us than marriage. Right. <laughs> and so like, I think if you look around the world to your point, Brett, and I think that's an amazing point culture in itself, man, why do you think divorce rates are so high? Yeah. Cause we live in a world now that says, instead of dealing with discomfort, including growing yourself and, and and allowing yourself god to heal you yeah um let's just cut cut bait and run you yeah know what I mean? and so i think all of that plus a bunch of other stuff comes to mind but man it's uh something healing about just being open about it and then talking with trusted brothers and then yeah like how much how much have we laughed before we went on just because like now it's all good like Jesus wound, hip healed all the wounds. And, and we're not done laughing. Like, we're, oh, for we're sure. We're planning on kicking nah. it. We're going to go eat pizza after this. <laughs> and tomorrow at and church. And tomorrow. It's going to be great. I actually Invitation. wasn't invited. Hey, you're um, all right now. <laughs> hey, I'm making a bunch of pizzas. You want to come later? Well, I just, I didn't know. We hadn't reconciled yet. And the last time we were all together, it went bad. I've been working with Cody for four years and we haven't even gotten, we haven't talked actually oh. in the last <laughs> four years. <laughs> This is the first secrets th- of ACF coming this out. Is, this, hey, is this is the is first time we've actually communicated. Hey, with you know what? Going. I'm not looking at you, and I'm not going to address you by name. But if you're sitting on the right side of this, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, um, I we were actually laughing about because it it's so funny how God has like changed it all up, and we started ready to do ministry together. Found out that we couldn't stand each other in some ways, and we didn't work well together. Only to be here more than a decade later. What are we doing? We're doing ministry together, and yep. we're laughing. Yep. Yeah, back then we were fighting. Now we're laughing, and Amen. you know, I and reconciliation is so much about the story of what God has done. And I, yep. before we go to that, I, I want to say like you, what you were saying, Jake, earlier about how this is what feels good because there's something about our flesh that likes to hang the phone up on people. Yeah, have you noticed that? Um, we like to hit the little red end button. Yep. Like we almost look forward to the moment we pick up and go hello. And then the, you know, like there's the silence and the click and then the solicitor comes on, you go click and it just feels good. And there's a part of us when we get into fights and arguments and we fall out with people, 
we just want to emotionally do that, hang mm-hmm. up on them and walk away. Like, I don't need you, which is so sad because our new series we're going into is why as God's people, we're better together. Yeah. And so if, let, let's spend the table a little bit and talk about how God has even worked to bring us together. It's the ultimate reconciliation story. Jake, you want to hit us off? Yeah. Yeah. And um, man, it's just, uh, I think it's funny, first of all, that I didn't even think of all this on the drive down from Corvallis and <laughs> Yet exactly like what the enemy had planned for evil, right? Our last, if we never saw get each other again after 2012, yeah. we would have never had this opportunity to talk and to clear the air and to forgive and to hug and to laugh, right? But we never would have forgotten the moment where Brett swore at that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I've ever... Oh my God, I did hey. not swear. <laughs> So you I, said did. A, I said a biblical word <laughs> in an unbiblical <laughs> way. <laughs> and to be honest with you guys, I think the the uh, the <laughs> perfectionist tendencies that God's trying to heal me from is like uh, I don't remember too many um, offenses toward me. Yeah. I think my biggest challenge is accepting God's grace and mercy for the mistakes that I've made against others. Yeah, which is why it was important for me to come down here even if it wasn't preaching, even if it wasn't podcasting. And and we're just throwing it all out there for you guys. Like the main reason I came down to Ashland this weekend was to look you in the eyes and look Brett in the eyes and say, I'm sorry for how I was not loving like Jesus back then. And that was the most important thing for me to do. Yeah. It's a, you know, we've, we've been through hard times together and, you know, we've been through good times and I've told our church, you You've heard me say this story from the pulpit because I've talked about reconciliation before, um, but I I hadn't told people it was actually my relationship with Jake. But when Jake and I kind of walked away from each other, we didn't talk for years, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until one of our really close good friends died traumatically at a church event. I mean, it was like a shocker. Yeah, that uh, I actually was like, I need to go sit down and talk to Jake again, and. You know, just to give you guys like a little insight into my heart because I'm not perfect. And I'll be honest, I was on staff here at the time, you know, and and that's and I'm holding that level of unforgiveness and unreconciliation. And it took a dear friend's death to realize it wasn't worth it. And so we're by no means like, you know, we're by no means perfect. I hope you guys can see that Jake's tearing up. I'm starting to tear up. Brett's on his phone scrolling through Facebook. Um, But (laughs) look at him. Are you scrolling over there? We're having a moment, bro. I, it was a work text. We're having a moment. <laughs> it was a work text. I just, I blanked out just for a second. Uh, and, uh, but it's so true. You know, like we're fallen people. Christians are broken people, but we more than anyone mm-hmm. have every reason, every motivation to get right. And it starts with the cross. You know, I was thinking about reconciliation today. More than often, 99 to 98% of the time, when we we need to find like reconciliation with someone, it's because both people in the party are wrong. Ninety nine percent of the time, when I can think about it, there's so few moments where I have to find reconciliation with someone where I have done nothing wrong in the situation. But when you go to the story of the gospel, that's that one percent situation where you have a perfect, holy, loving God. You have a a perfect universe that he's created and man in his image who's also perfect and sinless. And then they reject God and go live in rebellion. And God is so moved by love. He does the unthinkable because when we think reconciliation, we think two wrong parties making right. Well, God made reconciliation happen, but he had done nothing wrong. So he humbled himself to our level. In, in, like, in every way possible, he actually came as a man. He came as Jesus, and many of you know that, and gave himself on our behalf to make a way for us to come back to God and be right with the Lord. That's that balanced transaction idea of reconciliation. That's what God practiced. So when you call yourself a Christian, you have every reason and then some to be motivated to seek reconciliation with others. Yep. In fact, I'll just read this and I'll let Jake talk. It's actually very biblical. Paul talks about it in his letters, but this is what Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.16, he says, or 5.17, sorry, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. I love that. You're new. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is even the reason we can be united in the first place, Paul kind of writes about in Ephesians. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And we know this. If you're a Christian, you know this. You've been reconciled to God through Jesus. But look what he says here. It has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I don't think we realize that as Christians, that when we received God's reconciliation, we became the ambassadors of his reconciliation Mm -hmm. to the world. And Paul Paul takes it so personally, he says, our ministry, we've been given. That ministry that was God's to reconcile people, Paul says that's our ministry. That word, that reconciliation word from God, the gospel, Paul says it's our word now. And so because of that, I'm pleading with you to be reconciled to Jesus. I think that's that's like the foundation for why we as a church, why we as a people— Christian people have to embrace forgiveness and reconciliation. It's our calling. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I think a a huge part of reconciliation is forgiveness itself. Right. And, um, uh, one of, uh, one of our marriage mentors, uh, uh, older sister in Christ shared something with, uh, Jess and I recently, and she said that forgiveness is twofold. Um, and she heard this from a really, uh, you know, one of those really smart world renowned counselors, and they said that you one is you forgive the uh, instance, so the time, whatever the event was, the actual event, and then two, as a Christian, you have to choose to forgive the impact. Yeah. So that means, say somebody did something wrong and it really hurt you, and you say you forgive them, right? But then you see them later, and there's still some, you know, some of that not so fuzzy feeling starts coming up, and that's the impact like it impacted you beyond just a singular instant a moment in time and I I really thought that was helpful to me because it helped explain why Jesus would tell you know his disciples you know when asked how many times do I forgive my brother it's like seven times seven times seven times a day yeah Um, because he knew inside of us our psychological makeup our human flesh our tendency was going to be to say we forgive once yeah and then still keep holding on to it so yeah for me that's a conviction is like i'm trying to work on not just saying hey i already had that meeting with that person and forgave them but like every time i see them am i going for the back row and or trying to redirect my walking route so i don't have to interact with them well and we do that yeah. and that's the one part that we we didn't really talk about and brad i want you to weigh in on, on these thoughts too but one of the other reasons we don't always embrace reconciliation is it can be emotionally taxing. Yep. It's never, it's hardly ever solved o- overnight. Right. At least that's what I've realized. Like, have you even like had like a, a rough fight with your spouse or something like that? Not like by no means physical. And if it is physical, like, Hey, you should like reach out. We would love to get you some help, help yeah. you guys, you know, because that's a really real thing. But it, it, you have like a really bad argument and a falling out. And then the next day it still feels just like a little funny. You know, you wake up in the same bed in the morning, but you don't really look each other in the eye. You know, you go to the bathroom to brush your teeth and it's like no one's saying anything. And it's because like there's follow up and conversation and honesty and authenticity and you bearing your heart and me bearing my heart and and, and receiving from one another and humbling ourselves. And that can be emotionally draining. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And I think the way to sum it up, and we talked a little bit about this earlier too, is it's just easier it's easier to say, ah, forget them. Yeah. Like it, it's, if I'm honest, it's the equivalent of fast food versus healthy food. Yeah. Like spiritually, if you're going to have a healthy diet, you got to eat the vegetables. And yeah. that means like doing the work, like eating. I hate vegetables. I've always hated vegetables. I'll probably always hate vegetables, but I know I need them. So at 42 years old, my wife makes me like a little, child eat my vegetables but i don't like them jessica you're amazing by the way that's jake's wife she's awesome um so i i think that's that's one of the uh challenges with reconciliation forgiveness is it's it's hard yeah it takes work and it takes effort and our natural tendency is to want to take 
the life hack or the quick, you know, the shortcut or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, <coughs> a few things because I totally agree with you, yeah. but not now, Brett. Jake, I, uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> just kidding. See what I have to put up with. <laughs> Ruthless. <laughs> it's it's tough here, bro. <laughs> Oh man, he's gonna go back to Georgia. <laughs> no, I was just gonna talk about Georgia. <laughs> um, but now in Georgia, uh, you know the culture is put on a smile. Yeah, and like the southern like, culture, the southern culture, put on a smile, act like nothing happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that fast food you're talking yeah. about, because because you could hurt someone or be hurt, and in a lot of ways you're expecting don't talk about it. Right. Just like smile and yep. and be okay with them and and uh yep. and yet inside you're just burning with bitterness, you know, yeah. loathing, you know, and and it's so um that's why I, I love Oregon, uh well, Pacific Northwest, because like I feel like people are real, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. In, in some ways, not obviously not everyone, but sure. like people will um just tell you how it is in yep. some ways. And I and I think that's so important. So I was I was thinking about two things. One is, and it's all about how amazing Jesus is. But um, we were talking about how hard it is for us to open up and to say we were wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. And yet Jesus, uh, when he died to reconcile everything, he died for that part of us that we could not, you know, like admit to our wrong because right. he didn't do anything. Yeah. You know, he went yeah. to the cross yep. and he took that pride that we have, you yeah. know, and he said, Hey, I'll, I'll bear it for you. But then on the yeah. flip side of that, it's as you were saying, Cody of the, like <clears throat> on, on one side of reconciliation, there's gotta be forgiveness, real forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. And how amazing is it that when Jesus forgives, he forgets, you know, yeah. it's not like, it's not like the next day he says, oh, Brett, you know, I remembered what you did. You know, he was like, no, I don't remember that. And yeah. that's incredible. I mean, it, it, we, we just have to say, Lord, help us with Amen. that. Help us be able to not only forgive our brother, yep. um, but also just like, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against them. Yep. Anymore. I want to jump in on that, Brett, real quick, yep. because what you said right there, that's so key and that's so powerful. When I was in counseling, um, one of the things that I was working through is I had some very real anger and unforgiveness towards someone. And believe it or not, it wasn't either of you guys at this table. That's not me. Passive aggressively, like I had some anger at someone, and I'm looking. At them. No, <laughs> I, I really did. There's somebody else, not you guys. You guys are great. Um, and I, I wasn't ever okay. Never mind. I'll stop there. Uh, but it, it was someone I was. I was harboring a lot of anger against, frustration, and my counselor brought it up, and I saw. I could just see myself harden on the little Zoom screens. We we're doing like a Zoom call. And like my whole posture and demeanor changed. And we talked about it because there was a part of me that had been trying to forgive this person, trying to. But when I had talked with someone about it, honestly, I told them, and I'm, I'm being honest with you guys, I was like, I feel like I hate them. That's a sad thing to say as a Christian. And as a pastor, like it was even more convicting. I knew it was wrong, but that's where my heart was. And I was talking to my counselor about it, and he told me, he said, Cody, he said, I want you to sit down and write out all the ways this person has wronged you. You know, on the inside, maybe I'm thinking like, oh, we could be here for a while, you know? And he's like, and then I want you to write out all the things they owe you to make it right. What do you take to make it right? And, And I was like, wait a second. I thought you were a Christian counselor. That doesn't sound super biblical. And then he totally caught me off guard. And he brings up the parable of the master who forgave the slave the debt, mm-hmm. forgave the servant. We all love that. We all know that's me. Like, I'm the one who came to the master and he forgave all because we couldn't forgive it. He said, the master could forgive the servant the whole debt because he knew how much he owed him. He said, if you keep finding yourself angry and bitter at this person, like you haven't counted the costs of forgiveness. What he wanted me to do is sit down and write out all the ways I've been wronged, what it would take to make it right, and then look at that sheet and say, I forgive you. And f- forgive the whole debt and move, it, move on. He goes, the reason people keep having it come back up, come back up, come back up, is they haven't taken into consideration the cost of forgiveness. I think that's really good. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I think also the the um, I was trying to think and, and pray as you guys are talking and um, the the cultures that we're raised in and so um, I'll just use our culture for example, but it, it's by no means the only uh, Samoans are a shame and honor culture, 
And so our whole identity, our whole being, every the ethos of the Samoan people is built on this shame and honor culture. And yeah. so uh, in essence, what that means is the, the best thing you could be uh, to, to gain value, to gain stature, to gain influence in the culture is be an honorable person, right? And then on the other hand is like you want to find your quick way to be disowned out of your village and, and home, uh, conduct yourself in a dishonorable way. And, and I only bring that up because I, I realized through marrying a Caucasian woman that um, and I learned this from somebody else smarter than me told me years ago, but they said there's three major culture types in the world and there's guilt and innocence, there's shame and honor. And then I think the third one was like fear and power. Or something like that. But most Caucasians are raised in a guilt and innocence culture, which is whether people realize that they're not Americans, like their biggest uh, concern is being found guilty of anything. Yeah. And so they'll do anything, including compromising someone else's honor to 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 maintain your innocence yeah. or the perception of your innocence. Right. Likewise, different culture, same problem. We as as Samoans will do anything to cover up our protect our family's honor. Yeah. Even if it means in compromising, you know, truth. Yeah. And so all of them have like these these uh, what do they call virtues? These virtues that these cultures are based on uh, have have positives and negatives. But I, what I love and this is to roll it all into one is uh, Jesus embodies all the best virtues. Yeah. He is all honorable. He is all innocent yeah. he is all powerful yeah but he's none of the negative i feel like the homeschool culture is mm. the fear and power one like okay. fear of like everyone who's not homeschooled because yeah. you've never interacted with them but power because you want to rule the world because right. you've been home your whole life <laughs> that's deep it's deep Damn. if you're homeschool out there you know what i'm saying yeah <laughs> i'm just kidding yeah I, I, you said that and I was like, wow, there's like so much truth to that. It's not homeschool culture, obviously. And what sure. culture is that? Do you know? Uh, I think it was referred to, I'd have to ask, it was actually Rick Fletcher that told me about really? it. Really? Yeah, he had a book about it and uh, it was way too thick for me to we read. We should get Rick on one of these podcasts. You should. Rick's brilliant. Hey, that's a way smarter dude than me. I'll tell you that yeah, right now. I love Rick. Um, but uh, I think he said it was most prominent in like third world type countries. Oh, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Because everybody's vying for power. Yeah. Because in their mind, power equals stability. You know, yeah. So, well, and they use fear to manage people yeah. to maintain power. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then uh, the breakdown geographically for like um, guilt and innocence is very European and, yeah. and American. Um, shame and honor is mostly uh, Asian, uh, Middle East, big time. Pacific shame. Island. Yeah. And Pacific yeah. Island is because we came from, you know, uh, Southeast Asia. So. The, the the whole world has these different cultures. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yep. So anyways, just food for thought. It's good. It plays a part in it. Like it it plays a part in it because reconcilia reconciliation takes authenticity on your part. Sure. Vulnerability on your part. And that's where it's gotta start. And I, I even wonder like, cause like the pastor in me goes like and I even wrote in my own notes, like, is there someone I need to forgive or be restored to? And I think that's a good question for all of us to ask listening to this. Like, is there someone I've withheld forgiveness from yep. or that I need to go ask their forgiveness towards me? And and what would it take for me to humble myself, be honest with myself and say, yes, there is. And, you know, and maybe that's just the starting point, being honest with yourself. But honestly, you need to take it to God. Yep. And what I love about God is God is so patient. God knows that we have falling outs with one another. And I love that you said, Brett, that like God, like, it, like in the cross, in his reconciliation, he was also dying for the faults that we're going to have where we fall out with one another and have to find reconciliation. He's dying for that too. And he's so patient, just like God was patient to wait 11 years to make this podcast happen. Yep. You know, like I, I wonder if in that room when we fell out, I wonder if Jesus wasn't chuckling a little bit, kind of like, oh, just give him time. I'll work on all of them. And 11 years from now, they're going to do this podcast and they're all going to laugh. <laughs> and because God's in it for the long run. Yep. And we have to realize that too. This is definitely something that's, I'm changing points too fast now, but I want to throw out there. You have to be willing to be in it for the long run with people. That's what it means to care. Yep. Like commitment isn't fickle. Like when you say I do to your wife, it's for a, a, a lifetime or to your husband. Like to, it's for a lifetime. When you like, I found out when we had children, I'm committed to that human being until the day I die. Right. Like there's no, I will never stop loving them. I can never stop loving them because I, I have a commitment to them. And we need to approach reconciliation with that kind of commitment. 
Like I have to be willing to be in it for the long run to see things be made right. So even if it's they're not willing to be reconciled to you right now, how can you leave the light on for them? I've always loved that image. Like, how can you, like, like God, think about it. God died for all these people in the world, and yet there are so many people that are not reconciled to God. Yeah. But God doesn't turn the light off on them. Like, the light's still on. Like, as long as they're living, there's chance for them to receive Jesus and receive forgiveness. How can you and I do the same? Yeah. <coughs> Shout out to uh, Lee Edwards, right? We love that guy. Lee Edwards. <laughs> um, but he he taught when I, when I was leading the high school group in, in Corvallis. And uh, he taught one Wednesday night, and, and it always stuck with me. But he said we should um, treat people for who they will become, not yeah. who they are now. Yep. And, wow. And I, I just thought that's so powerful because, you know, like we, we are all changing, and, and God is so patient with, with each and every one of us. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, Cody is probably tired of this analogy, but it, it hits me so hard and Jake, I haven't shared it with you, but it's like, you know, we're, um, as Psalms one talks about we're a tree, you know, that yep. bears good fruit and trees grow so slowly. Like it, it's not like, yeah. you know, you shoot up a hundred feet right. in a day. You know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're constantly being formed, constantly being molded and shaped. And, and, uh, one year we're going to have some fruit the next year we might have a bunch more, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and it just takes time. Or it could time. be a drought year. Maybe could that be a year you didn't year. have fruit. And mm-hmm. and I think it just takes time. And so how if God is so patient with us and, and our maturity, um, how, how much more should we be with one another too of realizing that, you know, e- even if, if someone wrongs us, uh, can I look over that and say, you know what, I'm going to give them grace because yeah. I want to treat them for who they can be someday. Right. You know, not who they are now. That's so good, Brad. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a great analogy. Um, I was smiling when you said it, Brett, because we live on a, a very large farm. And um, the uh, some of our, our adopted family that took us in led me to the Lord all those years ago, own it. And they leased out the land that's all around our house. I think it's a little over 400 acres to a hazelnut uh, uh, farmer. And so we've literally got to watch these things. And, dude, as impatient as I am, every year – I ride my bike around, I walk around the fields, and I'm like, when the heck are these things going <laughs> to freaking do something? And they've been in for like three or four years now, right? And and I know they told me up front that they take about seven years. I was going to say yoga. seven years, yeah. yeah. But they look just like the little wooden sticks they were when they yeah. got stuck in the ground. Sure. So you said that. I was like, yeah, he's right. Those things <laughs> grow way slow. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, I got so much perspective working on Rick, bringing Rick back up, yeah. Rick's tree farm. Yep. with timber and Christmas trees because you plant a Christmas tree and you may harvest it six to eight years from now. And that feels like a long time until you're yep. planting a redwood. And Rick's like, yeah, I'll be ready in like 120 years. Yep. Like my great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren will harvest it. Yep. Yeah. Crazy. It's nuts. It's nuts. Yep. Yeah, and I think um, going back to this, my apologies for jumping back in this, but uh, something you opened up with code that I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, what would be helpful for people that are listening or watching and i just want to i'm not even going to be shy i want to beg of all the christians out there like man one of the biggest tactics of the enemy to keep the light and the love of jesus from flowing into the world is he tries to get us to like suppress the honest mistakes that we've made yeah you know the the transparency is almost taboo in a lot of areas and and you know as a as a, a leader of a small ministry in Corvallis, like I find myself even internally like, man, how much having these internal discussions about how much do I want to disclose? Because this is one you know what they say once it's on the internet is out. Like yeah. you, it's like toothpaste you can't put it back in. But and so like the <laughs> that's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but um, the devil like he loves to get us to. Th- to think, hey, if you say this, people are going to think less of you. Yeah. Or, and, and not like say whatever you want, but in the specific area of admitting wrong when trying to reconcile. Like you, well, part of the hesitation or, or, or reluctancy to to admit fault or to share your part in a dispute is like, man, I, could, I might get fired for this, you know? Yeah. Or, and, and I just want to encourage people like, man, I found so much more joy and peace by not giving a rip 
Yeah. Like if I'll tell you right now, like if the last argument that Jess and I had, I'll tell you about it. Like there's just freedom. Yeah. And, and I, I hope that we as believers keep growing in this. Like, man, God paid the price. It wasn't like for all the sin up to this point. And if you say it, then it's all, you know, it's, it's you don't have to turn it back in. It was for everything, past, present, and future. Yeah. And so I, I think anytime I'm the type of guy, anytime I find something good, I want to share it with people. And yeah. so, um, man, I just want to share that little tidbit about reconciliation is be the first to initiate forgiveness. Be the first to admit fault. Like, be the first. Like, yeah. that's what Jesus was. He went first. Like, so yeah. um, if that's a, any encouragement to anybody, I, I my one of my personal missions for Jesus is, like, I just want to break through this this cloud of, like, secrecy. Like, yeah. you don't have to, we're all jacked up, dog. I preach everywhere. I'm, I don't know what camera's on, but we're all jacked up. I'm jacked up. You're jacked up. Welcome to the jacked up club. Like, but Jesus paid for it all. And the last thing he wants is us thinking he loves us, but only if we're quiet about our our, our weak points, our blind spots, our mistakes. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so I just, uh, I want to encourage somebody out there. Like, man, Jesus paid for it all. Don't let the devil lie. Don't let him, don't let him win that battle. I'm going to have to look that word up later. Jacked. <laughs> so it wasn't in my vocabulary growing up my parents does that qualify that. as cussing well, let me say those uh, words no okay, I, I totally I was with you the whole time <laughs> Cody I could see his confusion I don't know I, don't know. <laughs> I was there what's with like, you so when you hear like, you like you like, what's the context if I use that word like if I go hang out with my friends later and say dude that's jacked up like what was that gonna mean it's not messed up messed up yeah. messed up there it is messed yeah. up yeah. it's not I like yeah. I'm ripped you know or anything yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah. oh messed oh. up that's good that you said that. I was going to go to the gym and be like, dude, I'm jacked up. Yeah. Did you see that? I benched 102. <laughs> you can use swole now. Swole now. There we yeah. go. Swole. Swole. Yeah, my swole on. Don't even say I went to the gym. So I just went and got, just got my, my swole, swole on. on. My, my favorite ones when people are like, dude, you got to glow up. I'm like, whoa. It's like grow up, but like glow up. Jake, just so you know, I always make fun of Cody for all of his <laughs> slang yeah. that he uses. Okay. I'm like, I like just, when he says sweaty. Like, oh, we were playing video games and we were just so sweaty. And what was I supposed to say? That's like, disgusting. Dude, like, this other guy was just like moist. Like, that's just weird. You just say no, sweaty. You just say we were playing video games and we did a good job. Like, that's all dude, you Dude, we know, were perspirating in the room. It's like a humidifier going off. <laughs> Uh, You've never heard the term sweaty. No, I have, and I hate it. I think it's, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. disgusting. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. I like to actually I study just slang. Of, I just think of like a, a kid, you know, playing video games for hours, and he's just all <laughs> sweaty because he's just in a hot room. And Do he's you just never like, you played know? with someone where they say that, and they're going off like, dude, someone pulled the drain. I'm drowning in here. It's so sweaty. Like, you've never heard that? <laughs> okay, well, you know what? It's okay. Okay, so I play with real gamers. That's why. <laughs> okay, <there laughs> Just kidding. Bro. So, so you, you you opened up this box. So I'm gonna say some video games. Right? Yeah, let's talk about video games. This has nothing, no spiritual relevance whatsoever. But since you said video games, my brain just went, "Whoa, video games!" I'm so frustrated that as a kid, we were too poor to have a video game console, <laughs> right? And so. God, God rest her soul, my auntie Sherry. She's in heaven now. She bought us our first, the original Nintendo. Oh yes! Whoa! Yeah. And Brad we was old enough like, to play that. I wasn't born yet. Yeah, eighties <laughs> baby, eighties baby. Um, That's right. Yeah, but um. Man, we were so juiced to get it. We were like, no, that's for us. And then we took it home. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So as time goes on, like we can't buy any games for it. We, we had we had Super Mario the game. But anyways, so all my life, most of my life, I was like, man, when I get older and I got money, I'm going a, I'm to a buy all the video games in the world, right? <laughs> so now I'm 42, and we have this, like, whatever the newest PlayStation is, because I wanted it, but I have no time or energy to play it. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, yo, God, this is a weird way to take sin out of our lives or, like, keep <laughs> idols in their rightful place, but this is kind of jacked up. So I, <laughs> Oh, you use it when praying, too. Yeah. Interesting. I got to oh, yeah. take notes on this. <laughs> Okay, so like uh, in my family, we grew. My dad. Now we're talking about video games. We'll get back to reconciliation. Uh, <laughs> my dad. They had the NES system. You remember that one, like the big cartridges. Yep. Yep. You had to like blow in it. It was like like a, an accordion or something. You stick it back in there and it would work. Well, we grew up with that, and then they got the Nintendo sixty four. And my dad. This one was so messed up because my dad was like too busy to work uh, to play it. Sorry, because he's working. But he would come home, and after they put us all to bed, he would play Nintendo sixty four. 
the Super Mario game because we were really little. And they would give us one day a week, and we had a limited time slot for each of us where we could play the game. And uh, he would get, get ahead of us that way and play all the hard levels because he knew we were just children and we couldn't win on our own. And then w he would let us try and try and fail and fail and fail. And then he'd call us on his lunch break because he had a cell phone back then. He was a contractor. <laughs> he was cool. And he'd be like, hey, I know how to beat this level. Yeah, I beat it. This is for real, guys. And dad, if you're watching this, he's dying of laughter. He'd be like, if you delete your account right now and restart, I'll tell you how to beat that level. So that way we were always behind him. <laughs> We don't we'd erase our accounts. We'd have to start at ground zero and work our way back up to that level to beat it. And then the next time we got to a level we couldn't beat, he'd be like, all right, I'll tell you how to beat it, but you have to erase your account and restart. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that awesome? That's jacked up. I was just going to say quali yes. that qualifies as Bam. jacked up. Jacked. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, cool now. We should get back to reconciliation. Okay, reconciliation. <laughs> Sounds like you need to reconcile with your father. <laughs> no, no, no. We're okay, on good terms. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's so fun, actually. It's cool seeing him, because I remember him as a dad to me when I was little, and then seeing, us, seeing him as a grandpa to my boys. Yeah. It's just so special. It's so special. I love my dad. What just, is it about that transition, dude? Like, I, I've seen it with my own dad. I've seen it with my two spiritual dads. Like, these men are like, so dad's ex-military, and then 30 years LAPD, gang task force, like my dad, right? Tough as nails, Take a you take a three minute shower, right? Like everything was militar militaristic, had to be spick and span clean, and then he turns into a grandpa, the best grandpa. Yo, and I don't know who this marshmallow man is, like <laughs> posing as my father, but the dude giggles and, and all kinds of, and I'm like, what in the world happened? And I see it happening a lot with even like the meanest of dudes. Oh yeah. They get grandkids and they're just like, kuchy, kuchy, kuchy. Like, what, the, what is this? <laughs> my my parents have been the best grandparents. I all my I mean Laura's parents have been the best grandparents, so they've all been great. But I I didn't get to see them growing up because uh, you know obviously they were Laura's parents. But my parents like my dad worked long hard hours and I mean like was driven and had stuff to get done and and yet to see them as grandparents and they're just so laid back and so funny yeah. like my kids look forward to Nana and Papa coming because Nana and Papa take them to get like all law and order goes out the window while they're there there's like yeah. donuts and sugar yep. and coffee and yep. all sorts of stuff that they take them to get and yep. they just love coffee? it so <laughs> yeah so they showed up the last time mom dad it wasn't real coffee thank goodness but they said they got in the car and our son just knows he can get away with murder when Nana and Papa are in town and he's like Malachi wants coffee. And they're like, oh, you want coffee? So they like drive him to human being and buy him like a steamer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then like they get him like toys. and It's like wonderful, but then they leave. Yeah. And then guess who has to deal with them? Right. Yeah. And then they drop him back off at mommy and daddy. And they drop him back off with mom and dad. Well, that's yeah. why they're having so much fun though. They are. That's right. That's right. And we wouldn't change it for the world. We wouldn't change it for the world. I actually look forward right, to it. Right. Are, so, you, are yours their first grandchildren? Yeah. So I'm the first oh, to get dude. married in my family and the first to have kids as well. Bro. As the first grandchild, let me just tell you, your oldest is going to be spoiled. Oh, we know it. I sometimes <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm like, I hope he realizes that there are because I have seven siblings, like or six siblings. There's way more grandchildren to come. Yeah, but he doesn't know how lucky he is because right now he gets all the affection from all the uncles, the one yeah. aunt, the grandparents. Like all the toys come his way, books. I mean, it's like Valentine's Day. He's got gifts coming. In. No one sent anything to Laura and I, but there's like gifts coming in the mail from Malachi and Truett. And, right. Yep. On the topic of family and transitioning back towards our original topic, um, I was thinking about because uh, we just used kind of that 11 year old event to base this whole thing off of. Um, I realize if if we don't learn how to reconcile with others before we get into different seasons of life that affects that next season life. So concrete example is when Jess and I got married in 2013, August 24th, 2013. Um, I, we've talked openly, so my wife's good with this, but I'll just share openly with you guys on this podcast. Like the first four years for us were miserable for her yeah. because everything you had described about Georgia, Brett, and I've heard this through other friends that live down there, um, that it's got this kind of pla plastic shallow type, Veneer. Veneer, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was doing as a as a high school pastor. Like I'd be Mr. Charismatic, Mr. Char Mr. Charming, you know, team leader, go get them, grow it, go it, whatever. But then at home, I was emotionally unhealthy. 
I was mentally unstable. I was short. I was, I've never, and I'll say this to the day I die, like, I've never put my hands on a woman in a harmful way. I never will. Um, but in every other way, emotionally, verbally, um, I was just a train wreck. And I didn't know that I was, like, killing my wife. Yeah. Maybe not figuratively. But she told me at, at times, like, I feel like I'm, I'm, because I'm always having to respond to you and cater to you, like, I feel like I'm dying inside. And I didn't even know. I was so unhealthy. I didn't know what effect I was having on her. Yeah. And so to put the silver lining on that, man, when she got pregnant, so we had a miscarriage first um, in 2017, and that was hard for us. But when she got pregnant with Taimane and she and it went past that, you know, whatever it is, 20 week thing where it's safe for. Yeah. Um, man, God did something crazy in my heart where he revealed that to me, that my unhealth was affecting negatively my wife and that I would never be the healthy, thriving leader of a stable home uh, that I wanted to be and that he wants us to be yeah. if I didn't learn how to reconcile yeah. better. So all this long-winded way of saying, like, man, I just, uh, I never forget. It was one night where she was a couple months pregnant, and I just like, God, I don't want to be this toxic husband anymore. I don't want to be this toxic leader anymore. Yeah. So show me whatever needs to be done. And honestly, that was the starting point that eventually led to therapy, that yeah. eventually led to even tighter accountability personally. Um, but I just want to say, like, if we don't learn reconciliation in the re in the peripheral relationships in our lives it will affect the more intimate relationships in our lives well because you take baggage with you yeah wherever you go yeah that's the reality of it and the yep. more you accumulate without reconciling the heavier that baggage gets not just on you right but on the people close to you yep yep and i thank god so much like we talk about it almost weekly it's kind of cheap it is it's very cheesy but it's kind of like corny even um, Jess and I are just grateful like man look what God did and we're in a completely different spot yeah but I had to learn how to forgive the little things in the relationships that weren't super close before I could be stable in the closest relationship human wise yeah. um, in my life and uh and I thank God for her too she's she's encouraged and affirmed like Jake you, you know God's softening your heart you, we feel so loved yada 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 and, wow. and I'll say this till the day I die bro I could fail as a a preacher I could fail as a nonprofit exec I could fail as a, a whatever whatever speaker but the one thing the two roles that I'm committed to never failing at by God's grace and with God's help uh, our husband and father those are the yeah. most important thing to me my board if you're listening i don't care if you fire me like not that you, you have reason to but like what will me will be more devastating to me than losing any job yeah is is losing the trust and love of my wife yeah and, and i so good dude so i just wanted to tie in family since we were talking about family to the reconciliation topic. yeah and the landing note for this is reconciliation is worth it yep it's worth it because we talked about all the, like the, the cons like oh it affects my ego it's this is it's emotionally draining it's taxing it's I gotta be honest with myself there's a lot of reasons for why we tell ourselves we can't get reconciled yeah. but none of them are worth what you're missing by making things amen. right amen amen yeah amen. none of it's worth it yep for sure same thing going back to the vegetables right. If you eat vegetables and, and, and work out and you look in the mirror, you'll be glad at the results in a couple of months. Like yeah. you eat fast food all the time and sit around making excuses why you don't want to exercise. Uh, you're not going to be happy with the well, results. You may say like reconciliation <laughs> sounds like eating cold veggies. Yeah. And I would say, have you ever had carrot cake? It's a dessert. What? Is that a homeschool thing? I, I don't carrot cake. I love it's like a veggie cake. cake. That's what I'm saying. Like you guys are saying, I don't like it's bad. Cake. I don't either. I hate it. But I'm just saying for those of you who <laughs> want candy, <laughs> reconciliation can be good. I was trying to like. No, have a cool that's point. good. No, no it's okay. No, no, I, I just great job, bro. Okay, thank you, thank you. There you go. Yep. Yeah, and on you guys are so affirming. <laughs> 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 that was the best analogy I've ever heard. <laughs> I'll be honest, I stopped for a second because I'm getting hungry. And so you said <laughs> carrot cake. I was like, dang, he's right. I'm kind of hungry now. <laughs> Pay attention to Jake. Let's go get some fast food after this. Let's right? go get some fast food. <laughs>
<laughs> oh man. Well, you know, Jake, thank you so much for being on here, sure. being honest, coming here to be with Brett and I again, and oh. sitting around the table. It's been too long, and oh. I, uh, like on the inside, I feel like probably chances are we'll all be around the table sooner than that again, Good. talking. If if not just for pizza tonight, Brett, you're welcome to come at pizza tonight. Thanks today. for inviting me, guys. You're welcome. <laughs> dude. Love you, dude. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> sitting around the table with you right now, like. Thank you, because I know it's like it's not easy, and, and I I even wondered what you would think when I said, "Hey, do you want to shoot this podcast on reconciliation?" You're like, "Dude, absolutely!" But I was like, "I want to tell them like our story," and for you being like, "Yeah," and so thank you so much for that because for sure. I think it's a good reminder that all like guys, all of us struggle at times with maintaining healthy relationships. All of us do, but you'll you'll come to know this. I actually have it written down as one of my values. I have certain value, like values and principles in my life that I've written down. Like I think it's eight values that I cherish deeply. And the last one, believe it or not, is confession. It is a value that I I hold so dearly to because I have learned that in confession, in repentance, there's restoration and there's reconciliation. Yeah. And those two things, reconciliation. And restoration are worth all the confession, all the repentance that it takes to get there. Yeah, it really is to be right with God and to be right with others is to be cherished, right. and uh, and when you do that, it's amazing how blessed your life is. I'll give you one one way you may not be thinking about it. All the heaviness you're carrying now from unforgiveness, like don't you want to let that go? Don't you want to be free? Jesus said, if you can't forgive people from your heart, it's like being thrown to the torturers. Do you remember when he said that? He goes, he told the story about the guy who couldn't forgive. You know, after he had been forgiven, he was thrown to the tortures and Jesus, so my father will do to you if you do not forgive others from your heart. That's paraphrased. But essentially Jesus is saying, unforgiveness is like the torture chamber mm -hmm. and you don't have to live there. The yeah. only thing putting you there is you. Right. You can choose to practice confession, repentance, and seek restoration and reconciliation. And it, they may not be willing. They may have a hard heart. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't be free from the burden in the meantime right. while you're waiting for God to work in their life. Yep. Closing thoughts, Jake? Yeah, um, man, it's been a blast to, to be here, and thank you guys for having me. I think the one thing, that I, last thing I'd like to share is um, just uh, the good news, as you were saying, about reconciliation, like the results of reconciliation, the, the prize of reconciliation, if you will, is so much better and greater and outweighs the price of reconciliation yeah and like for us as christians like no better thing to be in complete and open obedience to god right who do we want to please more than our father in heaven right and so that's pleasing to him but on a practical note it's interesting to me bro like all the things i've done in my life and, and some of you guys out there know like all the the mistakes before jesus um that i had made I was trying to, and I think this is a human tendency, but I'll just say it, for me, I was always trying to gain like uh, notoriety or, or, or fame or fortune or power, you know? And what's interesting to me is the more that we choose to be humbly reconciled to God and to others, the more those virtues that we're seeking actually come. Yeah. Like people, I, I, Without going into details, like I'm amazed at the connections and relationships that God's allowed us to build in Corvallis with people that are not Christians. Yeah. Like this guy without a degree gets asked to come talk at HDFS classes at Oregon State University. Yeah. But it, I believe everything in me, like the more obedient we are to God, including reconciliation, the more open doors he has for us to walk yeah. through. And just the freer that you are and the quality of life just increases and happy wifey, happy lifey, right? Yeah. So what? No happy wifey, no happy lifey. And so first four years was not just miserable for her, it was miserable for me because she's not happy, you know? Yeah. So I just see the fruit um, and the result when we walk in obedience to God's word in humble, you know, forgiveness. Uh, another quote I came to mind that I, I don't, you guys have probably heard, uh, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Yeah. It's like, so good. It's so toxic for our souls. And yet we carry it around. I carry it around at times. And so, um, man, I just want to encourage everybody out there. Like, man, it's so worth it. And I have noticed like this lighter mood, this like, I don't know if corny is going to sound like 
I, I love people a lot better now. Like, and I appreciate 11 years ago, Brother Brett challenged me, like, yo, where's your love? And, um, you know, truth without love is abuse. Yeah. You know? So I just, uh, I, I feel that happening. And last thing uh, in closing, I pass back to you, Cody, is like, I didn't even tell you guys this, but the whole church at Corvallis knows it because um, I preached on New Year's Day. Uh, God put it on my heart to write this list. 2023 is is the theme of my personal year is the forgiveness tour. Yeah. And it's a list of, of everybody from family members to former coworkers to friends or whatever that um, I need to either forgive or ask forgiveness from. And you two were on that list, bro. And, and like, I'm not going to stop until I finish that list of just trying my best to live at peace with all men and, and own up to my stuff from my past. And so I, I say all that because we're not just talking about it on the podcast. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, we're about that action. We're trying to live it. That's right. And uh, maybe it's worth ending it by saying, I'm not sure you're ever any more like Jesus than when you've are forgiving someone else. Amen. Like I, I've wondered that before, like that might be one of the times where I'm like, I'm behaving the most I could like Jesus right now yeah. when I choose to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. Brad. And we, <coughs> we appreciate Jake just yeah. I mean vulnerability and, and uh, you know, just being an, an example of, of like, you know, I was jacked up, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now, and now did he use know, that? God, right. I think I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know what Jack did. <laughs> no, but but really, like, um, you know, we were talking about n- none of us. And I, I'm not going to get into a lot of the context, but basically we, you know, a lot of people don't realize the three of us got into a room and we are all youth ministry yep. leaders. Yep. And we just saw things way differently. And so we started arguing about how to do it. And, and cussing. It, it, oh, my gosh. Yep. Yep. And... Um, <laughs> But but now we're able to look back and be like we were all yeah. so young, like we were just yeah. we were babies and and we didn't and yep. you know we we had a lot of life to live and we still do. You right. know, we're we're still we're still young in True. some yeah. regards. You know yeah. where um, I never want to stop growing. Amen. You know I n- I never want to stop Preach. learning from from other people and yep. um and being able to have the humility to reconcile with someone, forgive people, and um and know that that there's so much joy when, yep. when you do those things. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Yep. Yeah. Another like weird lesson that came out of that time. Cause uh, you guys were in your twenties, but I was like, I was going into 30. You could be 30 years old. And, like age is not an accurate indicator oh, of yeah. spiritual maturity. You like, can be 70 years old yeah. and struggling with reconciliation. Yep, sure. yep. So, and you could be in leadership positions. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we all were. Yeah. So, Lots of stuff coming out of there, but I appreciate it, bro. It's cool. Jake, thanks for being on here, man. You bet. Hey, I hope it's not the last time. I, it won't be, dude. <laughs> yeah. It won't be. Brett, you want to cue the music? Oh, yeah. It never gets old. <laughs> <laughs>